Okay? Can everybody hear me? Great. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for staying so late at uh, one of the last days of the summit. Um, we hope to give you an interesting uh, talk today. My, my name is Dr. Alicia Rosenzweig, and uh, I have here also uh, Ifat Afek, who is the uh, PTL of Vitrage. I'm a core developer in Vitrage, and we're going to talk today about some of the uh, ideas behind Vitrage, behind root cause analysis in general, what is out there, what can be done, um, you know, where, where do we think that we should be going with this, and, you know, please also, this is a, supposed to be so, sort of a, uh, a thought-provoking discussion, uh, to sort of think about things in a broad way, so whether during the session or at the end especially, we'd be very happy to take questions. Um, we want to make sure that we are aligned with the rest of you in terms of your vision as well. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about, first of all, what is root cause analysis? Why should it be done? Ooh, one second. I think we have a, a, a timed slideshow over here by mistake. Okay. Let's hope that it's not doing that. Sorry. Um, so what is vitrage? And what, 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 is it, sorry, what is root cause analysis and what is it good for? Um, then we're going to talk about um, some of the uh, aspects of Vitraj itself. So what we had to do in order to build this engine, what are the underlying components, the principles that guided us. Then uh, Ifat will take over and show us a demo and talk a little bit about what we see in the future of Vitraj and this um, also in this sort of broader perspective. So what really is root cause analysis? So if you look at Wikipedia, what is a root cause? So Wikipedia defines it as a factor that is considered a root cause if removal thereof from the problem fault sequence prevents the final undesirable event from recurring. This is a, a very interesting statement because what it's saying is basically is that we're trying to imagine what the world would look like if the event did not occur, if the fault did not occur. We're saying, had this event not occurred, then the problem would have disappeared. And so even by that definition, you can already understand why de determining the root cause of anything is, um, you know, has certain difficulties. Oh, one second. I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, and so that's, what, so, that, so that's what a root cause is. Root cause analysis is the method of identifying root causes in a system, uh, among system events, specifically usually in failures. Usually the reason we want to know why something happened is because something bothered us in what occurred, right? So we're not going to usually look for root causes for good things, but for bad things. Now, why is this important? Well, there's a lot of things we can do with the root cause analysis, okay? Once we know the root cause, this yields a whole bunch of features. So if we start on the right side over here, first of all, you get understanding, right? You want to know what's happening in your system. It's your system after all, or you're relying on somebody else's system. The second thing is, once you know what's the problem, you can have a fast reaction. Even before you've fixed the problem, before you've taken care of the root cause, you can already address it. You can say, oh, I have a problem on this host. Well then, I guess I should do my healing on a different host. Whereas if all you knew was that your VM crashed, then you could just move, you know, you might think that I'll just redeploy a new VM on the same infrastructure. So by understanding what caused the problem, you already gain uh, uh, the benefit of being able to act immediately uh, and, and have a very fast response. Um, next up is accountability. Right after the problem occurs, your customers are going to ask why. What happened? It's not only going to be your customers. You know, Nokia and uh, Vitrage specifically is something that we were working on in the context of NFV, of, um, of looking at, uh, you know, of taking um, uh, networking uh, facilities, networking infrastructure, to the next level, to, to moving to the cloud. Over there, issues of accountability, of performance, of regulation are very, very important. They're central. You can't make certain changes without being accountable and reaching a certain level of reliability in your system. So it's very important to be able to say why things happened and how you're going to fix them in the future. Without that clarity, you can't even make that move, even if you want to. Moving on, of course, then we have actual fixing. We know the problem. We know what the root cause is. We can go and address it. We can fix that, that host that has been giving us trouble. We can fix the, um, 
We can fix the switch that's uh, not functioning well. By knowing the problem, we can, of course, go and address it. And finally, perhaps uh, interestingly enough, uh, root cause analysis is simply the reverse, uh, uh, the reverse pr pr process of prediction. Right? With root cause analysis, we have a problem, and we're asking ourselves, why did it happen? With prediction, we have a problem, and we're asking, what is it going to cause? What is going to be the impact of this problem? So if in root cause analysis we say we have problem X, what is the problem Y that caused it? In prediction we say we have problem Y, what problems X is it going to cause? And so the moment you have the understanding of root cause analysis, you can just reverse the process and then start talking about prediction. And so you can see how moving both from a reactive, looking to the past, to what happened in the past kind of approach, to a proactive kind of approach, all this um, is under the rubric of root cause analysis. And so we're only at the beginning in terms of vitrage, but already we can see how much we could benefit if we had a very good engine that does precisely these things. Let's see if I can stop it from doing what it usually does. Okay. So what approaches are there to root cause analysis? Well, in general, we can classify this into three groups. Um, whoop, there we go. Again, ooh. Ha. One day I'll win. Um, <laughs> not today, apparently. Okay. Yeah, what is the root cause of this problem? Okay. Uh, maybe if I press this. Let's see. Okay, so we can classify this into three groups. One of them is what we call expert judgment. So this is what you would do before you had, even before you have uh, computers, right? We don't even need to have the cloud. You simply have people that are experts in a field and they go and they look and say, what happened over here? This actually takes place in many companies and whenever something bad occurs, you know, there's a safety regulation uh, that uh, wasn't followed, there's a certain problem in the quality of a product. You go, you check, you see what happened. How did this happen? How can we stop it from happening again, right? So this kind of approach, which is, you can think of it as like, you know, human manual kind of approach, it relies and reflects on the expertise of the RCA investigator, right? The person who goes to do the investigation. Um, and it's very subject to subjective bias, right? It has to do with what that person saw, with the priorities that person has, what they, you know, how they approach these problems, et cetera. And the data that we have for this is simply the experience of that root cause analysis investigator. Um, moving on to more autom automated systems, we have the statistical approach, which says, okay, we're gonna look at the system, we're gonna collect data, and we're gonna see, we're gonna check with the correlations and see, you know, how much do two events correlate with one another. And when they have this correlation, we can say, okay, so there's some link between them. Um, the move between correlation and causation, of saying A caused B, not B caused A, is not simple. Um, it's definitely a, um, a tricky issue. We can try and use issues that have to do with, um, um, with time-based uh, things. In other words, event A occurred before event B. Um, but that doesn't always work, especially when you're talking about high-speed monitoring. Sometimes you can have situations where one thing is monitoring things in a sampling rate of once every 30 seconds and another every once every five seconds. The fact that one happened, got to your system, your monitoring system before the other, doesn't necessarily mean that the first one caused the, the, the latter. So it becomes more tricky when you look at this in terms of causation, taking, taking it to the next level. But, you know, but it definitely helps to have that kind of chronological ordering. Uh, and finally, you know, statistical techniques are more looking at, you know, at what happens and learning based on experience. Then you have more analytical systems. Uh, ways that look, you know, like uh, forms of formal logic that try to reason about causation and think really in terms of um, what's called counterfactual reasoning, which is what I mentioned before, where you say, well, I see what happened, but if something had happened differently, what would have happened then? And counterfactual reasoning, while it's, once you have it in place and it works well, you can get things that you can really rely on. The difficulty with that, of course, is that a lot of times you don't have all that data. You don't always see the entire picture. So whatever you see is also a lot of times limited, um, though the methods you're using are more, um, more well-structured. Well so what did we do in vitrage? So we do definitely want to move on to more automated approaches, things that uh, Ifat will also probably talk about in, in, um, in the next section. But 
what we started from was what we call automated expert judgment. So if you recall from the previous slide, the first section was expert judgment, where you take people that have expertise and you try to take their information and debug the system, solving problems. The approach in vitrage is we want to automate that process. We want to take the information that we know about the systems, and in most cases, we understand each system individually. We have people that are experts in compute, people that are experts in storage. And each of them understands their piece of the system. The problem is they don't see the full picture. And the full picture is critical in order for us to make sure that errors get to where they're supposed to get to on time. And so what do we do over here? We have, we start over here on the right, we have expert judgment, and we codify that judgment into what we call vitrage templates. Um, so vitrage templates are YAML files, which you can see in our, in our wiki, some examples, and those of you who have visited our booth. But they're YAML files that express the rules that the expert sees as, yes, this can happen. If I have a high CPU load here, I'm going to have CPU performance problems there. If I have switch crashes here, that's going to create problems on the host, et cetera, et cetera. And so things you know in advance, things that, you can, that, either you've, that you've experienced, taking that experience and making it codified in these templates. Now you can see over here in these templates, I have these different shapes, and each of them represents a different error, OK? So we're going to talk about that in a second for the, for the second part. So you have this expertise, but then you also need to have the data. You have to have the, when something happens, you have to know what happened. And so you have to collect information from open stack services like Nova, Heat, Neutron, Cinder. Um, and you also need to collect information from external sources. OpenStack doesn't have everything. We have things from Zabbix, Nagios, other monitoring tools. We can collect a lot of information and pool it in, in one location into this entity graph, what we call. So the, these uh, circle round uh, uh, vertices represent the different resources. And the other shapes are the alarms that are being raised on them. Now you can see over here we have you know, a bunch of alarms that we've received from different monitoring tools. And we've connected them because we understand, oh, that alarm is on, on that host. The green alarm is on uh, the, the VM, et cetera, et cetera. So we just connected. Now we have these two components. How do they come together? So if you look at what we have over here, we have these rules saying, well, a blue triangle, <laughs> a blue triangle um, causes, um, that's the arrow pointing down, the yellow, the yellow square. And a blue triangle can also cause a green, a green circle, and a green circle can cause a, um, a red uh, pentagram. So um, not pentagram. I meant, um, um, forget what it is. Sorry. Um, and so we can connect these with these um, dashed arrows, which represent causal relationships, saying, oh, in this system, you can see that the blue uh, triangle caused these two alerts, the yellow and um, one second. The yellow, oh, sorry about that. I don't know what's, uh, what's happening over here. Uh, what's going on? One moment. OK, let's hope. Um, so you see here are two things. One of them is the root cause analysis aspect, where we can see that the different uh, alarms cause things. But also, because we know that a green, um, that we know, we know that a purple, uh, that a blue triangle also causes green alarm, a green, a green circle. And again, this is like short form in this visual thing, but it always happens like on a VM. So you can see here we have two VMs. One VM already had a green alarm on it. And then another one didn't have it on it. But if I know that having a blue triangle causes a green, a green circle, then I can also raise that alarm on the, green, on, on the VM. And this is critical because these deduced alarms and also changing state, which we can also do, what they're really doing is not just adding more alarms to the system. Think about it. If we have a host, which is the node with the letter H inside it, who sees the host? That's the admin. Who sees the VM? That's the tenant. So really, if I didn't raise an alarm on the VM, the tenant wouldn't see anything. He wouldn't know that there's a problem until he tried to use the system and discover that it's not working. So the deduced alarms are not just making more alarms and you know, adding more data to the system. It's making sure that the information gets to the right person, to the right user, that whatever's happening on their level of the system is being reflected in their systems. Okay, and we can do this you know, to any, you know, with all, well, using these rules, we can project the information, propagate it 
through, uh, through the system as needed. So what do we get from all this? So I've already mentioned a few of these things, so I'll just repeat them very briefly. So first of all, we get a holistic view. A lot of times we have this local understanding of what happens in each individual component. We don't see the full picture. So even though we're not doing automatic discovery yet, statistically, et cetera, we do see uh, you know, the big picture, the full picture, as a result of this kind of automatic expert judgment. Um, also, it puts together everything automatically, so it happens fast. It doesn't take days or hours. It takes seconds, milliseconds. The second thing is we propagate this through the whole system. And this is really just the first step, right? It's not that we think that this is the be-all and end-all of root cause analysis. Um, but it is definitely the first step because what it does is it gives you, first of all, a fast ramp up of, uh, of, of root cause analysis. Most companies have this information. They just want to automate it. And on the other hand, doing statistical and analytical approaches demand a lot of data. You have to have a lot of data you've stored up. You can get really meaningful results. Until you've done that, um, you, you might get all sorts of results, but you won't know if you're really uh, uh, finding the relevant, the relevant information. So as a first step to start working on root cause analysis and to add things that you discover, this is very, very helpful. And about that adding, that's the second point. It's configurable. So each customer may have a different system. They may have things that actually they care about that other customers don't. Maybe one, one customer runs with a system that constantly churns the CPU, and that's OK. And another customer thinks that a CPU, high CPU churn is, is a problem. So it really allows you to configure it initially to be appropriate for what you, for what you need. OK, I'm going to finish up with one or two slides about um, just a little bit about the structure of Itraj, and then I'm going to hand it over to, to Ifat. Um, this is a little bit about the structure of Vitraj. Um, so we have the data sources. Uh, this is a little bit outdated, but we have a few more here that are grayed out, but you can also, uh, also see some of them. Um, these data sources basically are the information that we get. This is what builds us the topology of the, gra of the graph, what is connected to what. And as you can see, we have here Nova, Nagios, uh, AODH. We have a POC4, Cinder, Neutron. We also have Heat and Zabbix. So we have a lot of um, nice uh, data sources. Um, all this gets propagated into the entity graph, the graph you saw before. It connects everything together. Um, so this is like the heart of Vitraj, where all the information is stored. Then we have the evaluator. So we gave it the templates. The templates that were put in the expert judgment uh, are what gets evaluated when changes occur in the graph. So any change is a reason to analyze and see, has this you know, any impact on my system? And these are the templates. So this is like a small excerpt from a template. And of course, whenever an event occurs, we have notifiers that notify externally to Nova, to AODH, and we can write additional notifiers to notify other services. In the context of NFV, we can notify a VNFM or other services that do policy. So notify whatever new alarms we raise or discoveries we have, we can notify. And finally, of course, like every um, normal project, we have an API and a UI uh, that, you can, that can be used to see the arbitrage insights. Yeah, so I think I went over most of these details. And so now I think is the time for our demo. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi. Um, so I'm Ifat Afarak, um, and I'm going to show you a demo of Vitraj after you heard about it and you heard about root cause analysis. So uh, let's see how it actually works. Um, okay, I'll just refresh uh, everything. Okay, um, so in Vitraj, we added a few uh, screens in Horizon Setup, and I'm going to show you these screens. Uh, the first one I'm going to show you is the topology, which is kind of a dashboard uh, that shows you the, the status of the system. Uh, you can uh, see quite fast and understand everything is green, everything is working well. Um, you actually see mostly the compute hierarchy, uh, what we get from Nova. Um, it's a sunburst presentation. You can see 
um, like the, the entire OpenStack cluster, and then you can see in wings like the, um, the availability zones, and then the hosts and the instances. For example, I can drill down to an availability zone, I can see some details about it, and I can drill down further to the host and to an instance running on this host. Um, and we will see later on that when something is wrong, this view uh, is very easy to identify where the problem is. Uh, but you don't see this many details. So I'll move to a more detailed view, which is Vitrage Entity Graph. And in this graph, as Alicia explained, uh, Vitrage collects data from different data sources and um, like uh, OpenStack data sources or external monitoring tool, and it combines everything into a graph and shows you the relationships of all these entities. So here you can see uh, the physical layer. You can see the computes. Uh, in this cloud are two availability zones and computes, and you can see the virtual layer, the instances. You can see an application. Uh, this is a heat stack. There are cinder volumes and the network, which is also connected to the instances. Um, so it is very clear to understand the relationships between different entities and how they affect it, uh, each other. And uh, now I'm going to simulate a failure in the system, and we will see how it is reflected in vitrage. Um, just a second. So I assume uh, most of you know Zabbix. Zabbix is a monitoring tool that is very common, and vitrage integrates with uh, Zabbix and Nagios monitoring tools. And I'm going to simulate a hostnik failure. Uh, this is not, it won't be a real failure, um, but I'm going to tell Nagios, uh, to, to tell Zabbix, okay, uh, uh, let me know there is a problem with the NIC. Um, sorry, I selected the wrong, uh, wrong test. So I'm just, uh, modifying the definition of the test. And um, this is a, a live demo, and I just modified something in Zabbix. So it takes Zabbix a while to, to understand there is a change and to, um, to notify me about the problem, because it's not a real problem. Um, and uh, after we see the, the fault in Agios, uh, which uh, just happened, uh, we will go back to Vitrage and see how it is reflected in Vitrage. So here we see Nagios, uh, Zabbix um, uh, thinks there is a problem with the NIC. And let's go first to the topology. And we see that not everything is green any longer. And it's quite clear that there is an area that is problematic. And now we can go and drill down and see there is an alarm on the host. And there are two instances in this host. And there are alarms on the instances as well. And if I go to the alarms view, I can see four alarms. Um, but I only told Zabbix there is a problem with the host, so why are there four alarms? And the reason there are four alarms is that three of them are deduced alarms that were raised by Vitrage. I can see it here. I can, um, uh, this view shows alarms of different types. Uh, here we see a Zabbix alarm, which is the original alarm, and three alarms raised by Vitrage. And we can also see Nagios alarms here, or AODH alarms. And um, now I want to understand what is wrong with my, with my application, so I can find the application alarm. I see the application is not uh, high, highly available. And I can open the root cause for this alarm. And in this view, I see a drop-down causal relationship of the alarms. And I see that the application is not uh, highly available because there is an alarm on the instance that the application is using. And this alarm happened because there is an alarm on the host about a, a failure in the host. And um, this view is context aware, meaning if I open it for another alarm, I may, be, may see a different causal relationship uh, that is relevant for this alarm. So I'll try and open it for the original alarm that came from Zabbix. And here I see that the host failure affected two instances. One of them had an, a, a, an application running on top of it. And the other didn't, so this is the entire um, effect that this alarm had. And if we go back to the entity graph, we can see the alarms in the entity graph as well. Okay, I'll just uh, move them a bit so it will be more clear. Oh, 
sorry. And here I also see the, uh, how these alarms are connected to the resources. So there is one alarm on the host, and the, uh, the host state is also changed accordingly. Oh, I'm sorry, I guess uh, the session just expired. Okay. It happens in live demos, I guess. Um, Okay, so back to virtual entity graph. I can see here the, the alarm on the compute and uh, the compute uh, state has also changed and virtual notified Nova about this change. Uh, so the change is uh, also in Nova. Um, and there is an alarm on one instance and another alarm on another instance. These alarms are connected to one another and there is an alarm on the application. And you can also understand from this view that this application has a uh, uh, two instances related to it. So um, it, th this explains the uh, alarm that the application is still running, but it's not highly available because one instance is down. Um, another thing that I want to show you is a new uh, view that we added in, uh, in Okata. Uh, so it's not in this uh, environment. I'll switch to another environment, which shows the templates. Um, actually, you saw like a tweak over here. Um, there was one alarm and new alarms were raised, and I'll I'll try to explain uh, how you configure this behavior because it's, not a, it's something that is controlled by the user of Vitrage. I'm just, okay. Okay, so this is a new uh, environment that has the template view. And over here, you can see a list of templates that are currently loaded in Vitrage and their statuses. And uh, in case you had a, an error, like a typo in the template, you see uh, in details uh, some hint about what's wrong with the template. And you can open and, and look at the templates. So over here, you see the structure of the template. Uh, these are, uh, on the first blocks, are like the building blocks of the, temp of the template. And the interesting part is the scenarios. We have one scenario about um, saying that, uh, as you see, it's very human readable. If the public NIC fails on host and the host contains an instance, this is a condition. And the action that we want to execute is one action is raise an alarm on the instance, and another action is set the state of the instance. And then we have another scenario saying if all this happened and the alarm on the instance was already raised, we want to add causal relationship to connect the two alarms so we know next time somebody asks, we know that uh, one alarm is the root cause of the other alarm. Okay, so this is for the demo, and I'll go on and talk about the future of Vitrage. Um, how do I switch? Spacebar. Oh. Okay. 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 Um, so I'll talk now about uh, the future. Of, uh, we have a very big world map uh, for Vitrage. Um, there are some functionalities that we would like to add. Um, one of them is an alarm aggregation. So you saw uh, there were three or four alarms in the, alarm, uh, in the alarms view, but imagine there is a very big setup, uh, like a production setup with hundreds of VMs, and you could get uh, hundreds of alarms, and okay, we have the root cause, but it's still hard to find the first alarm to start looking at it, and we would, uh, would like to add some alarm aggregation, uh, something that looks like a tree. And we imagine you seeing just the root causes or the most significant alarms or alarms aggregated by resource and then be able to expand and see all the details where it's, it's interesting. 
Um, another use case is the alarms history. Um, this is something that we also discussed in the design session yesterday. Um, right now, you see uh, active alarms in the system and how they affect an, one another. Um, but suppose there was some error that happened in the night, nobody was, uh, was watching, and the next day, uh, you would like to know what happened. Or suppose um, an alarm happened on the host, and the alarm was fixed, but the application didn't recover. So there still is an alarm on the application, but the original alarm is no longer there. Uh, we would like a mechanism that allows the user to understand what happens, maybe some kind of a slider in the UI showing uh, per time how the uh, root cause analysis graph looks like. This is something that we need to design and implement. Um, of course, we can talk about auto-detection of alarm uh, correlation. Uh, right now, it's configured in the templates of Vitrage. Uh, it could be great if we have a mechanism that uh, looks at the history and understands that whenever alarm A, a happened, then right after it, there was alarm B, so there must be a relation between them, maybe suggest a correlation or do something automatically. Okay, we also discussed uh, usability issues. Uh, the entity graph um, is a great tool for understanding relationship between uh, resources. But in a larger setup, it can be very crowded, and we wanted to find ways to highlight what's mostly important or uh, to, to let you see only part of the graph that is relevant for a specific use case. Uh, this is something that we also need to think about. Um, Time-sensitive uh, root cause analysis is what I just talked about. Um, templates, creation, and editing. Right now, um, you can edit a template uh, as a YAML file. We would like to have um, like a smart editor in the UI that allows you to edit template and maybe correct you if you make mistakes. The template is built with references between the, template, the parts of the templates. It's very readable, uh, very, very easy to understand, but you can make mistakes if you try to reference an idea that doesn't, uh, that doesn't exist. So, I mean, we have template validation already, but if we have a UI tool for that, it will be great. Um, okay. Um, regarding the, the language of the templates, there is a lot more we can add. Right now, our scenarios support uh, and or and all conditions but we would like to add uh, support for not condition, which is, uh, it raises some logic questions. For example, in case of a uh, high availability, um, there are two switches, and I would like to say, if, one switch, if two switches uh, are down, then there is a, a critical error. If one switch is down, it is a warning. Um, but I want to make sure that if two switches are down, then I don't get both errors, uh, alarms. I only want to get the, the, the alarm about the critical error. I don't want to get the alarm that one switch is down also. So I would like to say if exactly two switches are down. Uh, right now, the, the language of the templates uh, does not support it. Um, I'm sorry, it keeps moving. <laughs> um, and um, we, we need more data. I mean, the more data Vitrage has, uh, the more complex templates you can create, the more insights we can give you. Um, First of all, it means uh, more data sources. Uh, we would like to integrate with other OpenStack projects, uh, as many as we can, and uh, of course, uh, the external monitors. Um, everything that can give us more information is valuable. And we would like to add uh, new consumers. Um, uh, so Vitrage raises alarms and modifies states of uh, objects, but most of it is only in Vitrage. So there is one case where we notify Nova when the host is down, and we actually change the state of the host in Nova. Um, we would like to have more cases like this, uh, more integrations with other OpenStack projects. Uh, we have a POC of integration with AODH, which is telemetry alarming uh, service. So we know how to raise uh, Vitrage alarms in AODH, but it doesn't work well. Uh, it requires some uh, uh, some uh, coding in AODH, we already discussed it with them, and this is something that we plan to implement. So every Vitrage alarm can be uh, used uh, in AODH. Um, 
And uh, uh, we have a mechanism for uh, Vitrage Notifier, which is very easy to add another notifier if you have your own system that you would like to get notifications from Vitrage. But we want to make, uh, to write our, uh, on our own as many notifiers as we can to, to make it more easy to integrate with Vitrage. Um, and we need the use cases. Um, we have a few use cases that are used in, um, in Nokia Cibis uh, product, but, uh, and uh, uh, could be common, like Hostnik Fellow that I showed you, but we would like to understand more real use cases from customers that uh, we can support. Um, sorry again. Um, and we would like to have like out of the box template libraries, which is not so trivial because uh, the templates depend on the alarms that you get on the monitor that you have. And if you have Zabbix, Zabbix is a pluggable uh, mechanism and uh, you can put different tests in Zabbix. So uh, we can write templates that are relevant for specific tests and are not relevant for customers that have other set of tests. Um, but we do want to supply some, um, some example templates and uh, think of a more, more interesting use cases that these templates uh, can cover. And uh, make this large indispensable. We would like to, to reach a point that every cloud operator uh, will know that he needs Vitrage uh, to operate the cloud, to understand the faults, and to be able to manage it as easy as possible. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions for me or for Alicia. Yes. Uh, is that anti-graph creating automatically? So Vitraj knows the dependency with the switches, computes, VMs, or you have to create this relationship? Okay, so I'll repeat the question if you didn't hear. The question was whether the entity graph is created automatically. Uh, with all the relationships of uh, switches, computes, and VMs, or, you need, or we need to somehow configure it. Um, so uh, Vitrage is made of different data sources, and each data source is responsible for uh, managing its own relationships. Um, the, sta the switch configuration, we get it from a, a, a static data source, because right now we don't have anything that gives us this switch configuration. Um, so you, you define the swi uh, which switch is connected to any host. But this is the, I mean, in most data sources, do it automatically. If you, we connect to Nova, then we get from Nova a list of hosts and the relationship to the zones and to the instances. And if we connect to Cinder, then we get Cinder volumes and what, uh, each volume, uh, for each volume, we get the information what instance it is connected to. So each data source knows other data sources and connects to them. Uh, and altogether, it creates a nice graph. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Are the data sources yeah. uh, granular, are they on a kind of per project basis? So that as a service provider, you can provide a kind of base infrastructure of data sources, and then those projects can add their data sources on top of that to augment their view of, of Vitrage. Yeah, for sure. So uh, on GitHub, uh, as an open source, you get uh, currently integrations with uh, the basic uh, OpenStack uh, projects, and we plan to add integrations with other projects. But if you are a service provider and you have your own data, which is not uh, open source or is not uh, interesting to, for anyone, it's very, interest very easy for you to, to write a new data source, like a matter of two or three weeks work, to write a new data source and uh, automatically plug it in to Vitrage to have your own data and see it in the graph. Yeah, and there, there are people doing it in, in Nokia for another Nokia product. But then yeah. can, can projects then add their data sources that only they would be able to see that view of the world? Well, you see, the view that you see depends on, on your cloud, your physical cloud. I mean, uh, some, one thing is the, is the code, that you can write code that only you have it. And um, I mean, nobody else will use the code. And uh, what you actually see in the graph is, is the topology of the, the cloud that Vit Vitrage is running on. OK, uh, did I answer you? Kind of. I'll OK. <laughs> OK. Any other questions? OK. Um, again, the slide move. Uh, we are a relatively new project. Um, we, we started a year ago, and uh, in June, we became an official OpenStack project. 
and we are uh, looking for contributors. So, uh, and it's a very interesting project. So if you are uh, interested, uh, or if you have any questions, or if you want to give us feedback, or you have use cases that you would like us to implement, uh, we will be very happy to hear about it. Uh, there is some uh, contact information. You can use our mailing list, IRC channel. Um, we are looking for feedback. Yeah, thank you.